Hello. Thanks for meeting with me. Yeah, thank you. Um, we, we are at uh, Gray Studios, where yeah. I found out this is where you took acting classes when you were younger. Exactly. Crazy, right? How old were you? I was, I think I started the class when I was uh, 15, maybe? 15, 16? And I stopped when I was about 18. I stopped right after I got Teen Wolf. Okay, which is um, kind of the goal. Which right? was kind of the goal, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like, these classes work. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I just had fun in the classes. You know, like what I, what I loved about him was that uh, I grew up in kind of a small town in uh, just outside of Los Angeles. And no one I knew, you know, really acted. So I didn't really have that to connect with my friends. You know, we were all skaters and, and uh, like punk rockers. And um, so meeting kids that were my age that were cool and I could connect with that were also, you know, interested in, in this field was, uh, was what I was stoked about, you know? Um, and then, you know, I got to practice acting and yeah, it was cool. So it's nice being back here. Thanks for, you know, wanting to, yeah, of to do it here. Um, what, what got you into acting since you, I'm assuming you wanted, you decided at 15, you wanted to do it yourself. I was forced into it at a yeah, really yeah. early age yeah, and, yeah. um, Everybody signed, signed a contract and I can't, I can't break that contract. So. <laughs> Um, my dad got me into it. My dad is a writer and an actor and a producer, and um, he's been doing it since before I was born. And when I was a kid, my mom, I, had, I have a younger brother, and so she was, she was pregnant with him when I was pretty young, and, and my dad would be filming. On, uh, he, he, was, he was pretty busy when, when, when I was younger. He was um, always on like, these really cool guest star roles and, and, and starring in these like, really cool projects. He did a project called From Earth to the Moon with uh, Tom Hanks and... Ron Howard, that he, Ron Howard directed it and filmed in Florida. And my mom was t too busy to watch me because um, she had a baby in her belly. Mm -hmm. And my dad took me to Florida. I was about four years old. And I hung out on set with him the entire time. And sets are pretty grueling, you know. It's, it's you know, it's, it's an average of 12 hours. Um, you know, usually go over. And I hung out all day. I slept. I remember falling asleep on the floor and somebody put a tablecloth over me. <laughs> And I remember just kind of like kicking it and, and, and being kind of fascinated and not being bored. That's what I remember. My dad kind of saw that and was like, huh, interesting. Um, so he took me to an audition when I was five and I hated it. I wanted nothing to do with it. And I was like, I hate this, dad. And he was like, okay, cool. All right, we tried. What kid would like an audition at like five? I, I just, don't like them now. Yeah, I, I think they're probably one of the worst experiences you can put they're a human worst. through, which is like you have to practice something you don't feel connected to. They give you barely any information and barely. then they're going to judge you on it. And it's nothing like the actual atmosphere of when you're actually doing it on a yeah. set. You know what I mean? It's, it's like, it's, it's a terrible process. I hate it. I hate it. Change the process <laughs> somehow. I don't know how. Um, so yeah. you were pretty successful very early, and then yeah, kind of. With that success, people started following you. You started having interviews. Not that anybody does it on purpose, but there's this misconception that if they read a couple interviews with you, they see what type of characters you do, they see some Instagram posts that they know then who they you know are you, yeah. as a person. Sure. How you differentiate your characters and even your kind of public life mm. as opposed to who you are as a person, and keep those. Uh, separated. Separate. Yeah, well, I feel like what's cool about acting is that uh, you do get to take on a completely different role, you know? Like, uh, there's a lot of actors that always kind of, like, try to put themselves in the role, which there always will be, you know, a bit of yourself because it's you playing it. Um, but there's a lot of people who, who, who are, you know, they, they have a, a, a strong viewpoint or they, they, they don't want their character to look like this because they don't think that it fits who they are. But, you know, you're, you're trying to become somebody else. So um, separating my life from my characters is, is, is really easy because I think that's the essence of acting, you know, it's just like, I'm not very method, you know, I can kind of like get in and out of it pretty easily because that's, I feel like acting, you know, I don't want to like have to like live in a character for a month and beat myself up and I feel like it's pretty intense, you know. Um, so separating that is, is pretty easy and separating my life from, from my, my social life is this, it's the same thing, you know, I, I, I think at a young age, I, I kind of, you know, basically growing up on a set my whole life, I realized kind of what I didn't want to do and what I liked about the business and what I didn't like. And what I didn't like was kind of separating yourself, you know, who you are and, and, and painting a picture for other people to see. And, and that's something I've always kind of felt was just sort of, you know, wrong and, and, and for, and, you know, unfair for you and for other people because they're not, you know, they're seeing some 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 painted reality that like you know that makes them jealous maybe and and you know I I think that potentially you know you could look up to that but I think it'd be cooler to look up to somebody who really is like you know uh, this is me on the computer and this is me in real life and and uh, you know take it or leave it and 
So you try to be your most authentic self in anything yeah, that absolutely. you put yourself towards. Yeah. Would you say that that's kind of what drew you to be more open about um, the issues you've had with depression, the issues you've had with loss, and mm -hmm. and letting people see some of the, not just the softer sides, but some of the scarier sides that you've had to deal with with yourself and, and put it out there a little bit more publicly? Big time, yeah. yeah that, that, that was a big part of the reason why I did that. And the career that I chose, you know, the kind of the outcome if you're successful is, is that you're in the spotlight. And so, you know, I, I, I knew that and um, uh, I don't really like it too much. You know, there's a lot of parts about it that I don't really like. And uh, one thing I do like about it is that, you know, I have a voice now, no matter what. And I want to use it for, for good. And if I've gone through some pretty messed up stuff or heavy things that, that I feel like people need to hear and, and if people look up to me and, you know, it'd be cool to, to hear my take on it, then, you know, that's, that's kind of what started that. You know, me wanting to open up about everything that I've been through because, you know, I have a voice and I want to use it for good. Because I, those, those things that I'm opening up about got me in a pretty dark spot, you know, and, and I, uh, I felt really bad, you know, and I was in a weird hole and, um. Were you always open about that stuff? Like, was it, was yeah. it truly like, I feel bad, people need to see that I'm going through this and I'm going to use my community as a way to help me get out of it, but also educate people? Or was it, I'm in a bad place certain people helped me get through that bad place mm. and now I need to show people that there is a better way to go through these bad moments or these difficult moments or these stressful yeah. moments. Yeah, I, I think I've always been pretty open about about how, how I feel and I've kind of always worn my heart on my sleeve and um, my mom was a big part of that. She, she was the same way and kind of always taught me at a young age to just like let my emotions fly, be myself, whatever. Um, and, uh, and so I've always just kind of been open, you know, and, but, you know, I, at a certain point I closed myself off completely and, um, I, I did have to have the help of some friends and, and, and that did help me realize that there is so much importance in, um, in, in opening up to your friends and that connection. And even if you're just sitting there and not talking about anything and your buddy can just like, just hang out with you. It's a really cool feeling. It's really cool. It's I think that's what we're here as humans to do is just to connect and and you know with every living thing. Like my dogs are my favorite things in the world, and I just I, I get so much love just from hanging out with them and just connecting with them, you know. And I feel like they do too. And so it's uh you know I, I, I do owe a lot to my friends helping me out, you know. But I have always been kind of open myself. So would you say that your friends noticed that you were heading down into mm -hmm. a dark place and they reached out to you or did you have to come to a place where you told your friends like, I'm not okay. I think I need yeah. more help. I think I need, I think I need you to be there in a way that you probably haven't had to be there for me in, yeah. in the past. It was both. Definitely. Um, my friends would, would come to me, they would hit me up and I, you know, I would be in my house kind of just like hold up in my house with like piles of like delivered delivery food boxed up and, <laughs> and my friends would come over and be like, are you okay, homie? And I'd just be like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine, dude. And just kind of like shrug everything off. And they would try to, they would be there. They would try to help me out. They would, they would point out that I was, you know, bummed. But I came to a point myself where I had to be like, okay, you know, I think I do need to let my guard down, feel vulnerable. You know, I had this guard up where I was feeling like I could handle everything on my own. And almost like, I, I got complacent feeling like bad. You know, I was like, this feels good, you know. Uh, well, you become used to it. Yeah, super used to it. And also you start to, it almost feels like you, the feeling of happiness or even the feeling of feeling content starts to fade where you don't actually remember ever not feeling this way. Yeah, absolutely. It becomes normal. And you almost start to like like it. Or at least I did. It was weird. I felt like it, 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 it gave me... It releases you. In some ways, it releases you from obligations. Well, I don't feel good. I don't want to leave. I'm not going to leave. Yeah, yeah, that too. I'm a big fan of canceling plans. <laughs> well, that's just L.A. <laughs> that too. <laughs> hey, I'm from L.A. <laughs> um, yeah, when I would, when I would be in, in a dark place, I, 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 I almost liked it. Like, I, I felt good feeling bad. Like, I felt like a bad guy in a weird way, you know? Not like I was doing bad things, but I was just being bad to myself, you know, and just not... It was, yeah, it was weird. 
I feel like it's a law of diminishing returns. Like you, you get to this point where like, okay, you don't have to leave the house. You can get delivery. Nobody's bothering mm-hmm. you. You don't have to, there's no more auditions. There's no, you get to this point where you really do release yourself from all responsibility. And it's almost like, I think how like a little kid feels adulthood could be mm. like, I could just be at home and I do what I want and I wake up when I want and I eat what I want. Yeah. But then I think you have this law of diminishing returns where you're not connecting with your oh, friends. Yeah, absolutely. You're not seeing the people you care about. Yeah. You're not really feeling joy. Mm. And so do you feel like you hit that kind of wall and mm. that's where you, where you kind of told your friends like this is worse than it even looks on you know in in real life sure yeah no absolutely I mean and and the reason why I felt like I liked being bad is because I was self-deprecating you know I felt like I deserved it Uh, you know I I was like I hate myself I deserve this and I was super I was I was really hard on myself for a while up until just recently I've I've been pretty hard it was kind of hard to let that go even though I was feeling better I would always just like you know pick on myself and be like yeah I messed up I could have done that better or whatever would would you say you being hard on yourself was a catalyst to your depression the brain's a crazy place, you know, and it's a, it's a it's a long journey. If we had 17 hours, I'd be able to maybe break <laughs> into just the first part of that story. Um, but uh, you know, I don't think okay. So being hard on yourself, it, it does suck. But I think it's okay. I think it's always okay to keep yourself in check, and I think that's where that stems from. You know, self-deprecating and being hard on yourself. It gets to an extreme when you're really low. But I like keeping myself in check. Here you are at this point in your life where I'm assuming you're struggling to leave the couch. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, one thing that I, w- I never let falter though was my, my career. I, I always, maybe I like ditched out on a couple of auditions that I just wasn't feeling, but if I had the job, I was always committed to it. I was always on time and, and, and gave my best, my all, you know, I, I never let my emotions come into my work. And I think that kind of helped. When you do show up to your job, people you, you almost become a high functioning um person with depression or a high functioning person with whatever your mm-hmm. your illness is because people are like he shows up to work he pays his rent yeah he's clearly fine but i think it's the people close to you whether it's your family or your friends that starts to be like yeah but he's not all there yeah and he's not being the gregarious or fun loving person that we know that we became friends with what was what was the thing that your friends said to you or they were like this is beyond just being sad. Yeah, my boy, one of my best friends, the the dude that I've related to the most about spirituality, any of these do- uh, deep conversations, um, you know, he and I always had together, and they were always really cool, and we always connected on them, and it was always so effortless, and and there was no like male anim- uh, uh, like animosity or anything like that, macho or anything, and so it was it was these conversations were really cool, and he came over, and I remember just like being numb, and. Uh, I'm feeling just like, I don't know, just numb. You know, I wasn't like overly upset or angry or sad or anything. It was weird, you know? Um, And he came over and he was, we were hanging out for a little bit and he just was like, you seem really dark, dude. (laughs) And uh, that kind of stuck with me. At the time I was like, what, yeah, what do you mean? I kind of didn't care, you know, I was indifferent about it. Um, But, you know, thinking about it, I was kind of dark. Scary. It was like creepy. Did that conversation push you over the edge where you started doing something different? Or it, it just made me like- question it. Like I was like, what does he mean by that? I am dark right now. Like it took me a little bit to kind of figure it out. Like he left and I don't know, a week went by or whatever. Um, but I was like, what the? What does that mean? And I was like, I am. I am. I do feel really down. And I think we kind of like I had this sort of shift and. I think, I think what it was was that, um, like, that's okay, you know? You're supposed to feel sad. You're supposed to feel everything. And I think people get really confused when they're not happy. They're like, something's wrong. But that's not the case at all. Like, I, I started seeing ther- a therapist, and he's fantastic. Um, everyone should go experience therapy, you know, and have an open mind or whatever. Um, but he, he he said this really interesting thing where I was kind of like worried about how I was sad all the time right here and and how I, how I don't like this person when I'm sad and he said this thing is really simple but it was basically hey man there's a lot of different parts of you and you know that's what it's supposed to be why not well we're supposed to feel our array of feelings and I think yeah. especially I think the I think 
what's more difficult for men is that you guys are taught that you right. are only allowed to feel anger as your big feeling. That's sure. that's your feeling. Yeah. We cry. Oh my God, women cry, mm -hmm. and they are allowed to have that. But you guys aren't allowed to have this range of a feeling. You're not allowed to be confused. You're not allowed to be um, uh, uh, sad. You're not allowed to feel depressed. You're not allowed to have like the multitude of feelings that it seems children and women get. Mm -hmm. And I think when you are raised to not have this, you know, cry, you know crown box of, you know what I mean? Like the multitude colors that everybody else is allowed to have. Then when you do have a place where you, f you feel down, you don't even, you can't even identify it, let alone know how to handle it because oh, you spend yeah. your whole life pushing it away. And pushing oh my it God. Away. I have a, okay. So my mom, my mom passed away, uh, five years ago this December. And, um, I tried handling it really toughly. I was like, I'm gonna be the, the, the man of the house, you know? And it wasn't like, a, like, I wasn't trying to be cocky or anything. I was just like, I wanted to, I wanted to you know, be tough. You wanted to be supportive. I wanted to be supportive and, and, and I didn't want, you know, my mom loves us. Loved your boys. And I, I didn't want her to be sad, you know? I wanted her to, to uh, the, leave the easiest way that she could, you know? And I didn't want to like cry around her. She would have been cool with it. She was cool. I did, you know, but I want to be tough. And that wall I put up started kind of getting really confusing. And I would break out in anger. And one day this, um, what was it? Some, some, some therapist, I think, came over to the house and, and grief counselor, grief, grief counselor. And she was talking to me. I was like, I remember being, we were talking about it now, I could feel it. It's like, I remember being kind of like, Tickly, like angry, anxious feeling. And she said that it, it, anger usually comes from a place of like fear. And then when she said that, it was like turned on this wat waterwork switch and I just broke down and, and she was right. You know, I was super scared. And I think, you know, there is a stigma that guys can only feel anger. Um, but you know, it's, that's not where it comes from. Anger is kind of like a, a, a disguise for what's really going on. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's really cool feeling emotions. And I think that's kind of what helped me get out of it, you know, was realizing that, like, I am sad and I'm always going to be sad. And it's also the appropriate emotion. Like, at, yeah, sure. at, at one point, when are you allowed to have the right emotion? Your mother's passed away. It yeah. would be weird if you weren't sad. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, I mean... But at the same time, like sitting with that and realizing that I am all of these emotions. I am always happy. I am always sad. I, I've got all of these different parts to me, you know. Coming at peace with that and, and thinking about in, in the case of my mom's death, <clears throat> I'm more at peace with that too. Like it was going to happen eventually. Yeah. yeah. I don't know when. And that's, that's, that's one thing I think there's another stigma about is, is, is death. You know, it's, it's scary, but it doesn't need to be necessarily, you know? And, and I think that the more you kind of just, I don't know, just accept that there's different parts of you and sadness and that you're always kind of gonna be sad. And, and I think people get confused when they're searching for happiness. I, I, I talk to a lot of people kind of about the subject and they're always kind of like, what makes you happy? Do what makes you happy? What makes you happy? And it's, I think it's confusing because I don't think people are searching for happiness. I understand that that's what you think you're searching for because it makes you feel good, it's euphoric. But I think what that feeling ultimately is, is, is wholeness, like completeness. And, acceptance. And you, acceptance? I feel like that's... From like, from like people? From yourself. From yourself? Oh, sure, yeah, no, yeah, love. You gotta, you gotta make yourself proud, you gotta accept yourself. But I think what, what people are looking for, instead of happiness, is, is like feeling complete and whole, and you don't get that without going through the worst. And, and everything, you know, and experiencing it all and, 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 and knowing and admitting that like, yeah, I'm sad, I'm sad right now, but I'm also gonna be happy tomorrow and, and that's the way life is. Life is supposed to be happy and sad and, and I think people have different priorities, weird priorities nowadays. There's, there, there, I have all these crazy little like revelations and fantasies. I think the world could have gone in a bunch of different ways, but we kind of went to this, like when farming came around, started selling crops. And then there was this, you know, kind of currency exchange and money, and that turned into where we are now. You know, we, we, we have to make money to survive, and we have to have a job, and there's different tiers and classes. And, you know, it kind of, kind of came from a greedy place in, in, in a lighthearted way, in like this, like a slight way. 
they didn't know. It's not their fault, you know. It's just how they thought, you know. You want this? Well, okay, I'll, I'll take that in exchange. Wouldn't it be cool if he was like, you want this? Okay, cool. Yeah, take that. And then if somebody asks you for something, give it along to them. Pay it forward. You know, if that were the 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 mindset more community yeah more community and people started using instead of like money for currency they're using like mental capacities in some way like compassion or or kindness or 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 something the world would be a way different place you know what i mean if if there was no i don't know i, I, I like fantasizing about that stuff but what's nice about what you're saying is you can start with yourself and you can bring that um type of lifestyle to people like yeah. i i don't have a lot of money I don't have a lot of power. There's not really much, on an average day, there's not really much I can do to help most people. And I'm aware of that. But, at the but same, that's not true. But at the same time, you start to branch out what is help to people yeah. and what is um, even just relief to somebody, let alone joy. And I think, you know, my sister would love to take a nap. I can watch her kids. Um, I can do that. I mean, not great. I, my sister lost her two front teeth while I was watching her. So that's a little, people are a little shaky about me babysitting. Nice. <laughs> Maybe not the best example, Pretty but that cool. being said, I can, um, I've written personal letters to people that have made their day and that took 20 minutes of my day and I wrote a handwritten letter. Yeah. You know, you can, I, I often think that people are stuck with, with money being the thing mm. that, um, takes you to the next level of mm. happiness, but also takes you to the next level of giving back to people. Charities are asking for money. Yeah, but you could also, what you're doing right now, yeah. just talk about your experiences and change somebody's mindset for the rest of their lives. Yeah. And that takes all of a little moment of your time and some vulnerability, and that's its own power. Mm. And I think you're right, more and more, it should be less about uh, tit for tat mm. and more of you did this for you, but for me, think about that the next time somebody asks for an hour of your time yeah. and, and it might change somebody's life. Absolutely. That's all it is. That's what life is, man. It's like what I was saying, like people's priorities got confused because there was this greedy money, take, take, blah, blah, blah. And you know, it's not their fault. People have got consumed with becoming successful and, and being famous and, and whatever. Do you feel like um, you try to do that for the people that follow you or the fans that you have? Like you're in this place in your life where you have people that are watching what you do on Instagram, mm -hmm. watching what you say in interviews. Do you feel that um, you have a responsibility to put that out there and, and take care of people in that sense? Absolutely. Every single one of us that has any sort of presence on social media has a responsibility completely. There's millions or thousands or whatever people, kids, kids mostly looking up to you, watching you, and you are granted a responsibility whether you like it or not, you know? And you know, be, do good with it. Was there anybody that you looked up to? When oh, you were yeah. Big time. A lot of the jackass guys. <laughs> uh, honestly, a lot of the jackass guys, uh, the band Blink-182. Um, and you know what? I th you know, I th I, I've, I've thought about it a lot because obviously funny, hilarious, crazy people, um, very crude, all crude sense of humor, both groups, but very accepting and all over the board, you know, they kind of experience their emotions, you know. I, also like, like a group of people, like if you think about it, it's a bunch of guys hanging out with each other, yeah, supporting each other, supporting even each if other. it was in grotesque and ridiculous yeah, ways. connecting with each other, sharing experiences, and that is what life is about, you know. It's, and, they, and, and, they, and then they got famous because, because of it, and that was, you know, I, I think that's why I really looked up to them is because they were so accepting and Would you say that you, in your friend group or the people around you, do you feel like you going to therapy um, opened that up to people close to you? Do oh you yeah, feel like big you time. Influenced people? Yeah, no, I've 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 I've, uh, I've recruited a bunch of people. Yeah, yeah. Um, friends. Yeah, siblings. friends. Friends. Uh, um, uh, people I, I was dating and um, siblings and yeah. uh, dogs. Dogs. Uh, I've 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 convinced them to to start doing therapy sessions like they're yeah they do journaling they're the therapists yeah yeah great you know so like Hope i'll be on the couch and and we'll talk about you know squirrels and <laughs> what did they taste like you know i've always been so curious but they don't know either they've never caught one so <laughs> what do you what would you say is one of the most important tools you've learned for therapy to help you through some difficult times that the one where i said um there's different parts of you was a big one that I, that for some reason really helped me because I got so down on myself when I was, when I was feeling down. I felt like a loser. I felt like I was the biggest P 
piece of poop ever. Um, only I would use, you know, pretty strong words. I was not nice to myself. And um, knowing that there's different parts of me really kind of helped me for some reason. And, um, and uh, oh my God, yeah, there's, 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 there's a lot for some reason that one really helped. If I think about more, I'll let you know. Okay. There's, a, there's nothing you do like on a daily basis or a weekly basis that kind of keeps you in check? Like there's, is there, is, is there anything that it's um, added to your life to kind of keep you on track? Um, is there anything that when you start to feel that you are heading towards a depression that kind of little alerts go off and then you step, like yeah. I'll, I'll give you an example. So like um, I kind of went through a pretty bad depression last November mm -hmm. and I, I started to feel it. I started to start canceling on friends. Yeah. You know, the gym went from four days a week to two days a week, you know, it starts slowing it down. Um, I, I stopped like really pushing comedy as much, like just mm -hmm. doing what I'm supposed to, but not really reaching out. Mm -hmm. And I found myself eating a lot of meals in bed. That's oh, usually yeah. my first, like, I was like, I'm eating a lot of meals in bed. Mm -hmm. And I immediately called up one of my closest friends and I was like, I think I'm heading towards a dark place. Mm -hmm. I was like, I think I might need you this month. And I don't know, that is a complete skill. I mean, that's a skill that I got from therapy. Just A, being able to slowly see that I was heading down somewhere, yeah. but then also almost giving a point person to be like, hey, I might need you a little extra. Mm -hmm. Almost the same way that you would have a, a coach for a certain time where you're training to be in the Olympics or for a big race. I kind of assigned like almost like a friendship coach to be like, I think I might need you a little bit more this month. Yeah, of and course. I, and I, I don't think I would have been that person to open myself up, let alone be like, I think I need help. Yeah. And, and and do it before it got bad. Because that was the other thing is like, I, I don't know about you, but I've had depressions for two weeks. I've had depressions for two years. Big time. So you don't, you don't really you don't know. know. You don't know what you're going into. Scary. You're like, am I going into a puddle or yeah. am I going into a, a lake? A giant swamp. Yeah. Wait, are swamps yeah. giant? It could be. And you don't know what's in there. They're it, so that's, gross. That's, what I was, <laughs> that's, that's where I was going with. What kind yeah. of monsters are Murky. in these swamps? <laughs> so I guess that's my example to you. What... Do you feel like there's anything that yeah, you've added to your life? I do notice those signs. So all those things that you said, you know, kind of eating food in bed, um, can't, starting to cancel plans, kind of sort of falling back on your work just a little bit. Those are all things that sound kind of nice. Like it's like almost like a vacation. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. When I start falling into those things before, as soon as I ordered my first styrofoam thing, I saw it in bed, I would be like, I'm, I'm, I'm a terrible person, I'm the worst, here I go again. I've eased up on myself. And those things, okay, we're teapots, essentially. He, this is kind of true, like humans build up some sort of steam and you need to let it out. You do, athletes train and go crazy for so long and then they take a really nice break to calm their muscles down. We don't do that. We work, 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 And we need to take little chills. And when you kind of let yourself do that and, and notice the signs, it's easier to get out of it and find motivation to, to do your work. Once you give yourself a break and you're like, okay, you know, this is, why is this wrong? Um, another revelation I had is, is that you kind of have to be a little selfish. Yeah, not, absolutely. And not in a bad way, not in like, not in a mean way. Well, I think that's why the term self-care is taken off so much because the word selfish seems to like push people away sure, yeah. and put people on the defensive yeah. where I'm not selfish, but I need this moment as opposed to self-care being this big phenomenon for everybody. But that's pretty much what you're talking about, mm -hmm. which is I worked seven days this week. Yeah. I was on set for 12 hours. I barely know who I am as a person. I don't think I'm going to leave the house today. And totally I don't think okay. I'm going to make any plans. Totally okay. And even if you cancel a plan, too. it's There's so much stigma that if you fall out of line of being what, what everyone thinks a perfect human is, there's something wrong with you. But there's... We created those those guidelines how long ago? Like, to, like what, a, what, a, what a person is? And, you know, we're just now getting over the stigma, kind of, of mental health. And just now breaking into all these things that should just be normal. I've noticed in myself that some of my depression is um, triggered by events. Uh, I didn't get something that I thought I was gonna get. Mm, yeah. uh, I lost somebody in my life that I don't know how I'm gonna live without. Mm. But then I've also woken up and been like, I'm not okay and I don't know how long this is gonna last for. Right. Would you say that the, the depression you had after your mother died 
was it your first bout of depression or had you had experienced it mm, earlier? I've never felt anything like this. Have you experienced it since? Uh, I mean, it lasted quite a long time. Yeah. It's, it's been a, it's been five years almost, and it's uh, it's 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 been almost five years uh, that I, that I, that I was in it and kind of still dealing with it. And just now, honestly, I'm feeling I'm feeling really good. Yeah. And 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 in a really cool way, and like almost like a kind of a zen sort of. Um, I don't know. Things seem brighter. I think there's something really important to talk about there. That this was a a causational with mm. the death of your mother. It was something you had never experienced before. You have no experiences mm. to show you that there's an end in sight. And I think that's where a lot of people mm. struggle with depression is because it is both how you get in it and how you get out of it just kind of feels random and sometimes feels out of your control. And for you to experience it for the first time to, and also be dealing with you know, the loss of your mother, there's something very inspiring about the fact that it, you were in it for a long time, that you were able to continue to work and continue to grow and find a different version of yourself in some ways coming yeah. out of it. And I, I do think there are benefits to analyzing these dark times that people go through and seeing how has it made me appreciate where I am now even more. He, absolutely. So before my mom died, I had kind of two revelations and they were completely opposite. One was, and it wasn't necessarily a revela revelation, but I was excited to see the person I was gonna be afterward. I didn't know who was gonna be. I was excited though, you know, I was like, oh, interesting. I'm like gonna, a different version of adulthood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it felt like, but I was—I didn't know how to articulate it. And another thought I had was that I'm not gonna be okay. <laughs> like, it was—it was a scary thought. Yeah. Because I'm—I'm I'm a happy-go-lucky guy. I'm always this happy kid and blah blah blah, like innocent sort of and and uh, naive a little bit, you know, when I was younger and and was just always so happy. And that was my shtick, you know. And Teen Wolf, I was the goofy guy on in interviews and blah blah blah. Do something crazy, Tyler. Blah, blah. It was really scary because I was, you know, who I was was this really outgoing, really funny person, and and I started feeling like I I wasn't gonna be that, and then and then it didn't happen for a while, you know, and I was okay, like you said, it hits randomly, um, so I was kind of waiting for it, and then it didn't happen, and then boom, it was uh, it was really intense. You just weren't expecting it, and then when it happened, you weren't sure if you could come back from it. Yeah, yeah, I started feeling really scared that. Uh, I was losing myself, and I, 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 I really didn't feel like I was gonna be okay. And then, and then going through it, I was like, holy, holy uh, I'm not, I'm not okay. Would you say there's parts of yourself that you like better now that you have gone through it and you've grown from it? Oh yeah, I like myself. I love myself. I, I, I'm really proud of of how I've gone through this. You know, even even the dark times. Like there's no there's no proper way to grieve. Yeah, you know, I um, I I went I went through some pretty bad stuff. <laughs> like alone, I was alone. I was alone a lot, um, and I hated myself for it. And I thought I was a loser. Did you feel like a loser because you were sad? No, I felt like a loser because I was I was ex I was being a recluse. Okay. And I was um, not meeting up with friends, and I felt like I um, was just a bad friend, and I never I never got down on myself really for being sad. Because you know, you know, I, I'm 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 realistic, and but my actions, you know, I, I just kind of got down on myself for. Um, yeah, I don't know why. Just because I felt like a, I just felt like an idiot. Can hmm. you can you guide yourself through those feelings now so that you don't repeat them? So that when you do get sad or you do, let's say, call it you know self care, and you do take time for yourself, that you don't beat yourself up, or do you feel like? No, I hardly beat myself up anymore. If I do, it's, it's it's something new that I'm experiencing, you know? Like, it's it's a new mess up, I'm a mistake that I've made. I'm like, uh-oh, I need to work on that. Um, but I don't, I, I like I said earlier, I, I as soon as I start noticing those signs, I give myself a break. And I say, maybe I need to take a little break. You said in a, another interview that you didn't reach out to people because you felt like a burden. Can you yeah, talk more I mean, about uh, what that felt like and how that's kind of changed? Yeah, that's a super common, I feel like, feeling to feel when you're going through something and, and you don't want to reach out to people because of that. Um, I always felt like a burden. I, I just, you know, I, I know that my friends always want to be there for me. Um, but I but, guess the starch difference between somebody that's a happy-go-lucky, gregarious person to somebody that's sad and wants to talk about their sadness, it almost feels like 
you're a bummer. Not not just a bummer, but you're not even being the person that they became friends with. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And maybe they won't like you because you're not that person. And the only reason they liked you is because of this outward shell. Mm -hmm. And that if they know the inner you, they're not going to accept you. Yeah, yeah, I've definitely, I've definitely felt that. And I would just end up just not call people. I just would push people away. Would you say there was any other resources that you, that you used to feel better or still use to feel better? Oh yeah, sure. Um, responsibilities, um, and myself honestly i so i have three dogs and 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 loving those guys and knowing that you know they're only here for not that long and i'm going to give my all to them was really nice to i don't know make me feel alive and and just like i had something to wake up to every day and and i used to be the my my um antagonist and now i'm uh, i'm the good guy and i help myself out a lot you know i i used to be th- a bad person to go to when I was alone in my head. Um, but now I, uh, I kind of use all the tools that I, I've been taught through therapy, um, whether it was just kind of accepting that there's different parts of me or uh, kind of breaking down an emotion and, and a feeling and, and retracing it back from the beginning, sort of. And uh, I just kind of help myself out a lot and, and giving myself a break. So I, I, I'm a good resource. <laughs> um, so you put your, yourself in a position of service. For myself, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and, and for others too. Yeah, Absolutely. so you take care of your dogs, but also you can be the person you've. Now that you've kind of gotten yourself out of this dark place, you now know how to take care of your friends and family if they experience the same thing. Yeah, definitely, and I think everybody's different, you know. Um, so I'm not, I'm not like a, a guru at therapy by any means, but I feel like I can give a, a, a an interesting perspective because. I feel like I feel like I, I I feel pretty good and I'm proud of myself and and all the things I've been through and and where I am today. So if I, I feel like I can give a pretty good perspective, you know, and um, but I think it's nice to kind of maybe find an outlet, you know, and and take pride in something. Make yourself proud, whether it's waking up and cleaning your room, yeah. simple as that, or or calling an old friend or apologizing for something or or being honest. I don't know something that's been weighing on your shoulders, making yourself proud. If you can sit on your deathbed by the end of your life and be like, cool, I was proud of, of the little things that I did and the people that I, 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 you know, came in contact with, I think that's the real treasure, you know? Not all the movies I've done, not all the, the money I made or, 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 or that kind of thing, but just, you know, those, those kinds of little things. Yeah, you have a, a tattoo of two hands holding each other. Can you can you tell me more about um, why you got it and what it means to you? Um, I there's a band, a punk band called Bayside, and one of their songs is called "Looked Like Strong Hands," and originally that was going to be a part of the tattoo. I was going to get the the quote around it, um, but I ended up leaving it out because that would have made it really specific, and then I couldn't have had other meanings for it, you know. But it's also once I once I reached out. You know, really got out of my shell, and it's always hard. But the first step is always the hardest, and then it gets easier and easier and easier and easier. Kind of what it meant, you know? Yeah. It's like it's my buddy, it's me. I'm here for you, even if it's just unspoken. Yeah. You know, just kind of just be in there physically, or not. Yeah. Sometimes just not being alone. Is yeah. All the help you need. Yeah, definitely. Because you know we're humans and we're all connected and we're all the same thing. So it's uh, we should be connected. I love it. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome.